Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from beautiful blue sky San Diego as usual. And today I'm joined by Tracy Tim, who is in Dallas, Texas. Where it is doing, also Tracy? sunny. We are, and we're finally getting a little cooler. It feels good. Good to be here. Yeah, yeah, we had, yeah, we had a bit of a heat wave actually the last couple of weeks here in San Diego. And I know people have no sympathy for you when you complain about the weather in San Diego. So, I'm, I'm, <laughs> but I'm going to complain about it. It was really hot. Totally fair. Um, okay, so today we're going to talk about Tracy's new book, which is called Unstoppable, Discover Your True Value, Define Your Genius Zone, and Drive Your Dream Career. So first of all, um, let's just baseline it. What was the, what was the genesis of this book? Yeah. So I have had a career clarity business for six years now, and it took me about the first three years to really develop what was then going to be our core methodology. So what do we teach and what can we do that's replicable and how can we really deeply serve people? And so that was three years ago. Uh, and so the, the, the book Unstoppable is actually the step-by-step -step process that our business is named after. It's called the nth degree. Uh, and it's a step-by-step -step process for doing exactly what you just said. We help people go from stuck to unstoppable by helping them Desire, you know, really discover what their true value is, define that natural genius zone and that, that earned genius zone, and then also drive their career forward so they could actually achieve their vision. Yeah. Yeah. And I see you know, your first chapter says, get your mind right. And it's interesting because somebody, re somebody reached out to me yesterday and asked for my input on, uh, you know, how people can progress and get forward, you know, even in the midst of, of uh, a pandemic like this. And, and my answer was, it's all about mindset. And a lot of it has to do with whether you have an abundant mindset that sees opportunity everywhere and believes there's a lot of, you know, believes that there's enough for everyone. And even in the darkest of times, there's things that you can achieve, or you have a finite mindset. And therefore, you just think that if somebody else gets something, well, then they've just taken it away from you, rather than seeing it as actually, they've just shone a light and shown you the path to get things. So what, what's your what when you say get your mind right, what do you mean? Beautifully said, John. That was insightful. I, it's funny that you mentioned abundance. I have my, I have my moments once I in a while. I loved it. I'm like, this, you don't need me. You got that. No. I, I love that you said that. I actually just today got done writing an article um, that's going to go on a, a website called Miss Career Girl. And it was about mm -hmm. how to battle uncertainty. So how do you beat like doubt and fear and defeat in, especially in these uncertain times. And I, I like to go back to the Marianne Williamson sort of definition that you can have fear or you can have love. And in the same way that um, sort of, if you have light, there's no room for darkness. If you believe in abundance and possibility, then there isn't much room for fear and zero sum thinking and, and that level of uncertainty. So you have to create the scenario for not eliminating fear, because as we all know, we're biologically mm -hmm. hardwired to be afraid of stuff. Sure. It's like you used to run away from saber toothed tigers and now you're just running away from like writing a book or saying, I mm -hmm. love you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, right. It's, it's, but it, it, it creates the same <laughs> feeling. It's just, we're not in imminent danger anymore. Um, so you have to kind of know that and know that you're an evolved human and put fear in its place, which is not the driver's seat, but as mm -hmm. Elizabeth Gilbert says, the passenger seat or the trunk, because knowing that it's going to come with you, you have to decide what role is it going to have? Is it going right. to, am I going to let it be in the driver's seat or am I going to take control back and, and, and put it where it's supposed to be? But I think if you're going to put it somewhere else, you have to replace fear with something. And so as you're saying, mm -hmm. that could be abundance. It could be just shifting your mindset to less of a zero sum. I like to say, and it's, it's up behind me. It's she who has the most clarity will also have the most confidence and certainty. And when you have that deep sense of clarity, that foundation of who you are and the value you add and you can articulate it well, it eliminates a lot of the other fears and uncertainties and doubts that could creep in. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's really interesting uh, when you talk about, you know, it all comes down to you at the end of the day. And I think one of the, one of the steps to getting there is to take personal accountability and responsibility for life. If you say, wherever I am in my life today is entirely of my own making, and I own it, and I'm the only one who can change it, is, is such a transformative and liberating thing to do, uh, rather than sit there and go, oh, well, you know, my life at the pandemic screwed my life up, or, you know, the recession, or my boss, or whatever. Once you take responsibility, then you can move, start to move forward. When 
I couldn't have said it better. And in fact, there's a presentation I've been doing recently that's uh, really how to gain more career clarity in these times of uncertainty. And insight number one is you own and need to take responsibility for where you are in life, or you will always be a victim of your circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that too starts with giving yourself permission. If you don't fundamentally believe that you have the permission to pursue something, then it's wildly difficult to start to even think that it's possible. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you have to go even back to that level of, am I willing to give myself the permission to prioritize this area of my life to really make a change here and to believe that this is possible for me? Or am I going to continue to wait for this external you know, yes, validation or, or permission that likely isn't going to come if you're not mm-hmm. going to give it to yourself. So yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And it's like that when people sort of sit around waiting for their boss or their company to invest in their development and to look after their career. I mean, and I would say to people, the reality, should the company invest in you? Sure. Should your boss be interested in your career development? Sure. I mean, in, a, in an idea world, that would be great. But let's face it, a lot of the time they don't. The only person who truly cares about your career is you. So you've got to take ownership of it. Don't wait yeah. around. Develop yourself. 100%, man. Preaching to the choir. I love yeah. it. <laughs> um, and so you say your core, value on, your core values on steroids. So let me just start by asking you, do you think that most people know what their core values are? Because I have my doubts. Absolutely not. Absolutely. I think if you, if you grabbed a hundred people off the street, more than 90 of them w- would look at you like, I think I like freedom, you know, like they would, yeah. they would come up with something, yeah. but a uh, very few of them have them clear and easily accessible and actionable. Right. So even if you do, let's say, have, well, I know I have faith is important and I know family is important. And I know health mm-hmm. is important. Well, have you, the reason that we call it taking your core values and putting them on steroids is because the step that we skip is what am I actually going to do based on that value? And what can I confidently say no to based mm-hmm. on that value? Because if you've actually done that work ahead of time, then you simplify life right? And it, we're, we're constantly bombarded with opportunities, with, with new information coming into our world. And if you do it well, I think you can turn your core values into commitments, into a filter for all of those different opportunities mm-hmm. so that, you know, it's so easy to feel like, oh, this opportunity fell into my lap. This recruiter contacted me. This job is giving me this offer. And it's what I should do. It wouldn't have fallen into my lap if it's not what I should, I should give it its due, right? But if you've already ahead of time said, these are my 10 values and these are the commitments I have based on those values, theoretically, if that opportunity doesn't even meet core value one and mm-hmm. commitment one, it's gone, right? You don't even have to mm-hmm. give it a second thought and it eliminates so much of the emotionality and the just the grief that we go through in the decision-making process for anything like, but mm-hmm. this is about choosing a career, not like, what do yeah. I want to have for lunch? You know, mm-hmm. like it, it's, it's, so it yeah. sounds like it's worth losing sleep over, but if I think if you do it the right way ahead of time, you can simplify the process for yourself. Yeah. And I think the other thing is you touched on there is uh, sometimes and career and jobs are, are, are a, a fantastic example of this is sometimes, as you say, something will come our way and we will say, I should probably go for that because that's what ex- that's what's expected of me. Mm-hmm. And we do things because we feel like that's what's expected of us, maybe by our family, maybe by our imagine, you know, this, the imaginary society that we're surrounded in or where we're in this particular social strata. That's what's expected of me. Instead of asking yourself, is that something you want to do? And to your point, is that something that aligns with your core values? And ask yourself, who expected of who, who is expecting things of you, right? Because often we have, often we place so much emphasis on imaginary people. <laughs> Seriously, I we do. I couldn't have said it better. We yeah. always wonder, what would what people think? I mean, somebody goes, you, somebody's Ooh. worried about what people would think. And I always go, who, who, which people name them? <laughs> <laughs> I think you're spot on and, and it's, it holds so many good people back. And what mm-hmm. really keeps kept me up at night, like the reason that this business is so close to my heart is not only does it hold good people back, but it keeps the world from benefiting from the benefit yeah. that that person would give if they were in the right place at the right time, right? If they were living 
their truest value, their best and highest value as a professional. They'd likely be in a totally different role, perhaps in a totally different industry, making a real impact. And then what are the ripple effects that that's going to have, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, internally with my team, I'm like us getting one person to get a $14,000 raise or land a job in two weeks or like deal with the uncertainty of COVID is amazing as a single outcome. Mm-hmm. But think about how many other lives we've impacted yeah. because that life yeah. is living on purpose. And that life is literally just living their dream career every day. They're a totally mm-hmm. different person in their community. They're a totally different person in their families. Um, and that, that inevitably has impact that we can never know, but is amazing. Yeah. And on the flip side of that, if you think about it, what have we done? We've set up this expectation in, in many professions that, Uh, there's a progression and you have to become a manager and an executive and you have to manage lots of people. And that's the, that's the apex of achievement, Uh, right? right. So what do we end up with? We end up with a lot of people who go after these positions because they think that's, that's what's expected. And they think, okay, that's what society has set up as the pinnacle of of success. So I have to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you get? You get a lot of people who are really, really bad at it, who make everybody else miserable, who aren't happy in the job themselves is not where they should be. And to your point, this is the opposite ripple effect where it's just a, you know, ripples of misery. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. It's, and it's so, um, it catches, right? It's like a disease. Like, and I find that I'm that kind of person and I really magnify how I'm feeling around others. So if I'm in a great mood and I'm in my, my awesome you know, role and I'm doing my thing in a given day, I have so much more energy and it energizes everybody else around me. But if I'm just in a funk or whatever, I, I tell my team members, like, don't come here. Like, don't, let's not do any calls today. Like, go do your independent work. I'm going to do my independent work because I don't want it to rub off on them. Um, but you're right. It's, it's, especially in a work environment, right? Like one bad apple Mm -hmm. that has a toxic attitude or energy or is just misaligned values wise is going to really stand out and it impacts everybody else. Yeah. And I think, like I said, and I think a lot of the time it's, it's not that they're deliberately doing this It's because they've done what's expected of them and they've gone something that they're not qualified for. I like also you say, see others as valuable mirrors. So talk to me about that. This. Okay, so this is an entire chapter around one of our core concepts in our career clarity programming. So if you think about the ways that you can add value as a professional, there's really two. You can add value via something that comes naturally to you. So a part of your personality or behavior or gifts, and then you can add value via something that you learned or earned over time. So those are like your knowledge and your skills and your expertise and pretty much that plus your core values as a human and what you deeply care about. Those are the three puzzle pieces that make up your niche. But within that natural piece, right? What we say, and we say it so flippantly, it's like, know your strengths and like take these assessments and know your behavioral set Mm -hmm. and set yourself up for success. Well, most of us, really suck at doing our own introspection, doing our own internalizing of what, of who we are and how that adds value in the world. And I think it's because we're too close to the problem. Like my, mm-hmm. one of my business coaches, uh, I have to give her credit because she basically wrote this joke. She's like, I really think that doing introspection alone is like asking to do a gifted cardiothoracic surgeon to do her own open heart surgery. Right. right. Like, does she have the expertise? Yes. Does she have the tools? Mm-hmm. Yes. Does she like maybe know the strategy? Yes. But your perspective is so off that it's going to be messy and probably um, a catastrophe. <laughs> so, <laughs> probably, probably lethal, really. <laughs> yeah. Lethal. That's even better. So, this um, exercise from this chapter, which is uh, we call the interpersonal mirror or the mirror effect is instead of putting the pressure on yourself to know everything about you that's awesome, that adds value, ask other people just ask other people. And we, we challenge our clients to pick 25 and everybody's like, I don't know 25 people. (laughs) Really? You know, 25 people, give me a break. Um, because if you ask 25, you'll hear back from 15 and you'll get a good data set. But we just ask one simple question. Just go out to them and say, Hey, I'm doing this course or Hey, I'm reading this book. I I need it. I need help seeing the best of me. Can you just tell me the Mm -hmm. three best things about me or the three ways that you think I add the most value or the three, you know, maybe professional whatevers that are the best about me. And what's fascinating is everybody hates to do it, except for someone like me who's like, oh, stop, <laughs> tell me what you know, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, everybody hates it at first. And then they're like, 
oh my God, this is amazing. Like the feedback is amazing. A, they feel very affirmed, but B, they start to see really significant trends. Cause mm -hmm. it's, it's my belief that when you show up as your best, that's very consistent. So whether it's a romantic partner or a platonic relationship or a friend or a, a, a parent or a colleague or whatever, when you ask them the best, what's the best about me? Where do I add the most value? You, we historically get somewhere between three and five total categories of responses. So wow. somebody may say it as caring, somebody may say it as loving, somebody may say it as nurturing, but that's one sure component of you, right? That's one strength. It's amazing that when we really force our clients to then categorize them, so put all the similar things together, it's maximum five different things, even yeah. though all these people are in different areas of your life. Yeah. And you know what I love about that is the fact that you're asking them for three things about you, you know, that's the best about you that you do well, as opposed to just saying, you know, can you tell me like, what are my strengths and weaknesses? And then, because, you know, because then, you know, you'll get 52 weaknesses and you'll get one semi strength that people throw in just for good or measure. You'll because you'll get we're 52 just, strengths and you'll only focus yeah. on the weakness and then, uh, and then yeah, that ruins yeah. the whole exercise. But so, unfortunately, yeah. I mean, humans are hardwired that you give them the both choices. If you give them the strengths and the weaknesses, they will, they'll go immediately into all the things because they think, oh, I'm going to help you because I'm going to tell you all the things that you need to fix about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't play around with that. We're like, if you have this one life to add maximum value, like let's figure out the way that it comes most easy to you and, and most natural. And then let's just double down there. And it doesn't mean you just ignore the things you're not good at or ignore the weaknesses. Sure. You no, set yourself course. up for success by doubling down on the, on the good stuff. And then you fill in the gaps with other things, whether it's yeah. teammates, if you're a business owner, or it's, uh, you know, knowledge and skills that you can build over time, right? It's, it's, you're just but, so much better equipped by yeah because one one of the great one of the great fallacies of 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 management is that uh, yeah you know, when people come and they do performance reviews and all of this yeah. stuff and they they say you know well done Tracy here you're good at this this now here are your areas for improvement and that's what we really focus on and and yeah. they may and the trouble is they may be areas of weakness for you because you're no good at them and you don't like doing them and you're never going to be very good at them. So instead of us saying, okay, let's try and focus your job around the things that you are really, really good at. Instead, we waste our time over here trying to fix the things and make you good at things that you're never going to be good at. And it's, so, it's such a silly concept. I couldn't agree more. It really mm -hmm. is. <laughs> so talk <laughs> to me about... Yeah, talk to me about cultivate a nothing is wasted mindset. Uh, this is one of my favorite chapters because it came to me in a personal story. So okay. um, when I, so the, the whole genesis of my business is that I had a degree I loved in psychology, but no idea what I wanted to do professionally. Mm -hmm. I got swept up in the, the rat race of um, what was happening on campus because I went to Yale. So a lot of people recruit Ivy League students for these high powered sort of, you know, the, the, the mm -hmm. pinnacle of success jobs. And I got one. I worked on Wall Street for two and a half years. But just like you said, I didn't care to get any better, but would continue to beat myself up because I wasn't, you know, achieving at the high level that I was mm -hmm. used to as an overachiever, overscheduled millennial, right? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so when I quit my job, because I had to, I literally was at my wits end. I was like way overdosing on NyQuil to fall asleep because I was so anxious all the time. Like it was, it was bad. It was unhealthy. Um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to figure it out quickly. So what I did was re-enroll myself in school and go on a semester at sea, um, which is an undergraduate study abroad program that your, your listeners may be familiar with. Okay. And so it allowed me so to it's not lit. Out. It's not literally at sea, right? It's literally at sea. You're oh, on a boat. Literally you at sea. Oh, you are. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. It, yeah, it is amazing. Um, so I went at 25 as a post grad, which meant I was sailing around the world for four months with about 700 undergraduate students and then a handful of like lifelong learners and a bunch of other people uh, and I met some <laughs> incredible mentors it allowed me to test out going back to school or um, traveling or potentially working in the sort of nonprofit social enterprise mm. space and one of the mentors I met uh, was her name's Topi I believe if I remember this correctly she was one of the very first female editors-in-chief of the LA Times she had this really illustrious career and now she was really passionate about helping young professionals um, 
excel, you know, figure out what their niches are and that sort of thing. And so mm-hmm. she, she and I met under very horrible circumstances in Cambodia of all places, but we sort of fell in love with one another on the trip. And she's like, let me help you. I want to mentor you. And the nothing is wasted mindset came from her because I, I went to her sort of hat in hand and said, all I've ever done besides the jobs I had growing up and the jobs I had every summer, you know, which were largely sales based, um, which mm-hmm. I'm good at, uh, <laughs> which you may or may not have seen already, um, were, were, this was my only job. I had this one singular Wall Street experience and I hated it and I knew I didn't want to do it again. And so I was like, how do I... St- I have to start over. Like it was so daunting to me, the idea of having to start my career from scratch, even though I was only 25, it felt like I had wasted, you know, several years of my life trying to figure this out. So she literally looked me in the face and was like, wasted. Nothing is wasted unless you waste it. She's like, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at all of your previous jobs, not just the last one. And we're going to define what you learned and what you can take with you. What did you learn and what can you take with you? And part of what you learn is things you don't like. Part of what you learn are things that you do like. Part of what you learn is what you can tolerate and what's a deal breaker. And then part of what you learn is the transferable stuff, the skills, the knowledge, the expertise of of things that you want to double down on or things that you're like, if I have to use it, use it again, great. But am I going to base a career on it? Probably Mm -hmm. not. Right. So she just, I literally have the notebook. It's here in my office that still says on that sheet of paper from 2013, nothing is wasted unless you waste it in all caps. And that's been a crucial part of our business. Cause no matter if you're 25 or 65, yeah, y- you feel like you wasted time. If, and, and, and if you want to make a transition, it inevitably feels like you're starting, you're going to have to start from scratch. Mm-hmm. And that keeps 99% of people in crappy jobs, right? Cause who wants to take a yeah. massive pay cut and start over even if you don't yeah. like your job, you're like, I don't want to do that. Like that. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I love, I love about that because um, a, a number of years back, because you can look back at your career and so you can say, oh, you know, sometimes there are, there are jobs that were fantastic. Sometimes there are things that you, you chose didn't work out so well. And it's very, it's very easy to go, oh, you know, I wish I had never gone there and done that. <laughs> and and yeah. a number of years ago, I, I was I was going to the back through my my past and then I sort of said you know I need to change my my attitude to all of this and I need to look at everything you do in life as a path right as a pathway and sometimes you go on a path and you think it leads to is leading to a destination but it's actually not it's just leading to another path that's leading to a destination yeah. and sometimes I look back and I say okay I I used to think of I took that, I went and did this, and, and it didn't really work out that well, and it was a mistake. However, if I look at what happens subsequent to that, it would never have happened without doing that. So it was never a mistake. It was part of the journey. It was a path. It wasn't a destination. It was just a path to another path. And I think that, and to your point, and I think if people look at things that way, it's, it's never too late. It's never too late to change. And sometimes, and sometimes just to open, part of it is just opening, opening up to opportunity. Doesn't it I've go had back a friend. to that mindset can, yeah, that we started it with? It's like you it have does. to believe that it's okay to change. You have to believe that you're capable of it. You have to believe that it's possible and, and that it's okay. You know, and sometimes just not, not to, late. yeah, and sometimes not to overthink it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of what I attribute, um, you know, I've had a, since I came to the States, I've had a, just a, I've had a fantastic career. I've had so many fantastic experiences I've, uh, in so many different areas. Uh, and it all came about because, I decided I was just going to take opportunities when they came. And to be honest, regardless of whether I was qualified for them or not, I was just go. going to, I figured out that I could adapt and I turned out that if I If you're that listening, I don't skip over what yes. he just said, which is <laughs> if you don't feel like you're qualified, just shoot for it, y'all. It's, yeah. it's especially if you're a woman out there listening, that is so anti our DNA. Men are like, oh, these 15 things, if I hit seven, I'll apply. And women are like, <laughs> oh, well, this item sub A level B, I didn't, yeah. you know, whatever, I, I, so I can't apply go for it. I just, I want to make yeah. sure that didn't get. No, no, I did. I mean, then sometimes I went, well, I, you know, I, out of those 15, I could, I could bluff on one, I think. There you so go. I'll just give it a go anyway. <laughs> no, but here's, but here's a good point. Did you say, I mean, and, and, and to, to women out there, particularly again, I would just address this is we have an awful tendency of 
underestimating our expertise and our experience and what we have and what we have done. And so we think we don't qualify or we're not good enough or we don't have the experience or we don't have anything interesting to say. Um, the fact is you are more experienced, you're more insightful, you've had, you, you, you have way more, more skills and things to offer than you think. And, and the rest you can learn. So just go for it. Like go for, don't be afraid to go for it. And if it, and you know, what's the worst that happens? It doesn't work out. It doesn't work out. You just, as you say, nothing's wasted. Nothing is, especially if you can draw any sort of lesson from your previous experiences, it is not wasted time. Um, But it's up to you to go searching for those lessons. That's why the end of the phrase is nothing is wasted unless you waste it, which is possible. Yeah. So listen, Tracy, this would be fantastic. Um, The book is called Unstoppable by Tracy Tim. Discover your true value, define your genius zone, drive your dream career. And there's the book on screen there. (laughs) And several copies behind me. Thank goodness. We finally got that all set up. Yeah. So all of Tracy's information will be below this video. But before we go, Tracy, do please tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Sure, absolutely. So in addition to being the author of Unstoppable, which I'm so proud of and so excited of, it's been wanting to come out for a long time. um, I run a business called the Nth Degree Career Academy. So what we do is help people go from stuck to unstoppable in their professions by giving them all the tools that they need to discover their true value as a professional, to take all those puzzle pieces and use them to define their genius zone so they have the best chance of succeeding at the highest possible level. And then we give them all the strategies necessary to drive their career forward, to actually engage with and realize their vision and their dreams, even in these times that we're experiencing, which of course everyone says are of great uncertainty, (laughs) Uh, which frankly, to me, just highlights that life is uncertain. And a, a, a really great strategy for an uncertain life which is any life is to have as much clarity as you can so you can at least have a semblance of control and then also to have that mindset we talked about of taking responsibility and ownership for your experience and in this case specifically for your career so if that really resonates with you whether you're a person whether you're just out of school or you've got a side hustle you're thinking about or you just feel like you can level up or maybe you've gotten burned out and stuck and you're in that jaded phase and you need someone to give you a kick in the butt and tell you that it's possible that's what we do and I have two amazing people on my team who are our career coaches, our clarity coaches, uh, and they facilitate our programs beautifully. And I'm here to just announce this to the world that we are the best kept secret in career clarity. <laughs> so if people want to learn more about our programs, they can go to nth degree, nth degree dot Tracy Tim. That's my name, T-R-A-C-Y-T-I-M-M.com. And then my personal page is just Tracy Tim.com. So T-R-A-C-Y-T-I-M-M.com. And of course, if you want a copy of the book, which I would love for you to pick up, especially if you've got somebody in your life who like needs a little nudge, um, buy this for them. Uh, unstoppablecareerbook.com. So unstoppable is the title, career is the subject. It is a book, unstoppablecareerbook.com is where you can go for that. And as I was saying to somebody earlier today, um, let's face it, you can't go to ball games right now. You can't go to concerts. You can't do all of those other stuff. So guess what? Uh, buying Tracy's book is the cost of one beer at your favorite ball game. So come on. You can, you, yeah. yes. And invest in yourself. <laughs> wow. Thank you, John. That's beautifully oh, said. And I love when we could put those things into context. <laughs> All right. Perfect. All right. Thank you. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another interview really soon. And thanks again, Tracy.